Hey, am I coming through? Cool. Hey, so um, our last talk of the day is Tim Sarong. A couple years ago, I saw what was probably one of the most informative and entertaining talks that I've ever actually seen at an LCA. Tim didn't give that talk. <laughs> but Tim was literally the slides for that talk. Um, I'll leave him to it. Tim Sarong, everybody. Thank you. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm really delighted that I'm in this beautiful green room because I work, this is almost Sousa Green. It's, it's, it's really comforting. Anyway, I'm here to talk about extending C++ with Python, which is usually the opposite way. Uh, it's usually done the other way around. And uh, talking about the journeys that we have is sometimes more interesting than the destination. So. This is a story of one of my little coding journeys. Um, there will be lots of code snippets, so I hope everybody's strapped in for that. And so I'm first going to talk about why you might want to do this heinous thing, then explain some general techniques, and then show how those techniques were applied in a specific project, which is Ceph, and then cover the remaining weirdness that I went through. So. For this to make sense, I have to talk a little bit about Ceph first, but I'm not going to show the classic block diagram with Rados and RGW and uh, all those, because anybody who is interested in Ceph has already seen that, uh, and it's not terribly relevant to the techniques I'm talking about here. Uh, instead, I'll just say, if you don't know what it is, it's a massively scalable distributed storage system which you run on many nodes with many disks in each. Uh, it's awesome, and if you want to learn more about that, you should go to Sage's talk on Friday just after lunch. The core of Ceph consists of several daemons written in C++ and some command line tools written in Python. And in order for the command line tools to do stuff, they send and receive chunks of JSON uh, over a socket to the C++ daemons. Originally, the Ceph daemons that existed were uh, the MONs, for short for monitor, they're the brain cells of the cluster, if you like. Uh, OSDs manage individual disks with data on them, um, the Rados Gateway and MDS daemons. More recently, uh, initially in the Ceph Kraken release, another C++ daemon was added called Ceph Manager. And there were two reasons for adding this new daemon. One of them was to offload some processing from the MONs to somewhere else so that the MONs became more simple and uh, statistical information that was interesting to users but not critical to the operation of the cluster was moved into this separate daemon. And the other reason for creating this new C++ daemon was to add the ability to extend core Ceph functionality by writing Python code instead of by having to write C++ code. There's various advantages to writing in Python rather than in C++. There's a whole lot of available libraries that you can use to do interesting things. If we have a Python interpreter embedded in our C++ daemon, the Python modules that we load have much more efficient access to the in-memory data structures on the C++ side without having to go through all of that JSON generation and parsing. And it also means that we can implement little custom Python modules to either run one-shot commands to do something interesting, or we can have long-running server-type processes implemented in Python, which means we could embed a REST API easily so other applications could then use the REST API to control the Ceph cluster. Or uh, one that was added more recently was uh, so a Python module which inspects how the data is balanced around the Ceph cluster and then will change that on the fly. And so we can do all of this in neat little Python modules and they have some callbacks to get cluster state and they're notified when things change and like I said the option to add one shot commands or run as a server type thing. So this is why you might want to extend a C++ to extend C++ with Python. You've got a large, complicated C++ application, and you want to be able to easily add new modular functionality to it uh, that doesn't necessarily need the C++ magic, or you want to take advantage of existing handy Python libraries. So time for some code. If you want to invoke Python from C++, 
this is the least that you need to do. Uh, Py set program name, uh, allegedly informs the interpreter about paths to Python runtime libraries. I'm slightly less certain about that, that but that's what it says in the documentation. Uh, Py initialize actually initializes the interpreter, and then if you want to run a little piece of Python, uh, can everybody read that? Yeah. Yep, cool. Um, you can call py run simple string, give it some code, and uh, this will obviously print out, look, Python. Or you can have it execute an entire file with py run simple file, giving it a file pointer and a name, and then you shut down the interpreter with pyfinalize. So that's fine as far as it goes, but we want to be able to do more than that. We want to be able to load Python modules and call functions in them, and we also want the Python modules that we load to be able to call back into the C++ code. So to load a Python module and call a function within it, you do something like this after doing the py initialize business. Py string from string, uh, you pass that the name of the module you want to load. That gives you back a pointer to a, a Python string object. You then pass that to py import import to actually import the module. Then to get a pointer to the function that you want to call in that module, you call py object get at a string, passing a pointer to the module and the function name to call. And then finally, py object call object to call that Python function. The null pointer that I'm passing into py object call object means I'm not passing any arguments in. If you wanted to pass some arguments in, you'd construct a py tuple here and send that through. The other thing that I'm suddenly introducing in this slide without bothering to explain, explain it first is reference counting. Um, everything in Python is reference counted, so if you get back a pointer to a Python object, um, you hold a reference to it and you have to decref it so that it gets cleaned up. Py decref um, you use when you know you don't have a null pointer. If you might have a null pointer, you can use py x decref. To do the converse, if we want to have some C++ code that you can call from Python, you do something like this. So the first thing here, we've got a really simple uh, function called answer, which ignores all of its arguments, and it simply returns the value 42. Then you set up a table of functions that you want to expose to Python. Uh, here there's one function called answer, pointed to our answer function. There's a doc string that tells us this function returns the answer to the ultimate question. And then later we call py init module um, with the module name that we want to expose to the Python code and appoint it to that table of methods. And that means that we can now, in our Python code, we can import the ultimate question module and print out the answer to the ultimate question, and that comes from the C++ side. I'm sure we can all agree that that's very useful. So that's the basic principles. Um, back to uh, the specific application that we had, which is Ceph Manager. The new Ceph Manager daemon, as I said, is what's responsible for loading our custom Python plugin modules. John Spray, one of the upstream Ceph folks, did the initial implementation and that used essentially the techniques that we just went through, but uh, it's slightly more complicated. Ceph Manager will load whatever plugin Python modules that you ask it to, there can be lots of them, and because we want to be able to implement long-running server type things, each of these are generally run in a separate thread. We're also exposing a couple of module-like things from the C++ side to the Python code. There's a logger for capturing standard error and standard out, and there's a module called Ceph state, which has functions for getting information from the cluster and, and um, getting and setting options and, and sending commands and things. And the API that was defined for these Python plugin modules uh, is fairly simple. Um, there's a Python class called manager module, which you inherit from when you create your own plugin module. Um, the manager module class sets up some, it's got some helper methods and it sets up a logger and does some other things. But the interesting parts are the pieces that you override. So if you wanted to implement some one-shot commands, you would fill out the, the commands array here with a list of the commands that you support and you'd implement the handle command method. And then when somebody types in you know, Ceph module activate, that comes through to the handle command method that you've implemented in your Python plugin. 
For doing long running services, you implement serve and shutdown, and serve just needs to sit there and spin for as long as you want your thing to run for, and then needs to go away when shutdown is called. And finally, there's a notify method. If you're interested in cluster state changes and things, that will get called automatically when the cluster state changes. Initially, there were two plugin modules included with Ceph Manager. One of them was um, uh, to give some extra file system statistic commands. So you could run Ceph FS stats and get some interesting information back. And one uh, provided a REST API for other applications to maybe manage the Ceph cluster through. Uh, wow. So that's two convenient examples of the two different uh, modes that we support with these things. Bearing in mind the structure of that class, on the C++ side, there's a, an instance of a C++ class created for each loaded Python module, and that has a suspiciously similar structure to our Python code. Ceph Manager keeps a list of instances of these so it can iterate through them and say call all of their notify methods when something happens. And, uh, and each of these, if it's implemented the serve method, will run in its own thread. So to instantiate a Python class, the manager pi module load function, is basically the same as the earlier example of calling a Python function. Um, pi string from string with a module name, pi import import. Um, then we call pi object get at a string with the name of the class that we want to get a pointer to. And if we call pi object call object on a pointer to a Python class, it will give you back an instance of the class as opposed to calling a function and getting back the return value from the function. Uh, that extra argument to uh, pi object call object, that's an example of um, sticking something into a tuple so you can pass it through um, as an argument to the function. And that, that there is actually just the module name that gets used as a little prefix in log messages and stuff. If we want to call a Python method, for example, the serve method, um, it's just pi object call method with a pointer to the class instance that we've just created uh, and the, the name of the method to call. Uh, but suddenly I'm introducing something new again without bothering to explain it in advance. At the start of this function we've got pi gil state ensure and at the end we've got pi gil state release, uh, which means we need to talk about the gil. The Python interpreter isn't fully thread safe, um, which I suppose everybody knows. So there's this thing called the global interpreter lock, which needs to be held by the current thread before you can safely access Python objects. In the initial example on the first slide, we didn't need to worry about this because it was only one thread. We've got multiple threads, now we do. So here now in our, our uh, main initialization of the whole thing, um, just as an aside, we're calling pi sys set path with a custom module path so we, can, so we can find our modules. But the important thing here is uh, pi eval init threads. That initializes the gil and acquires it. And then we go through and uh, load all our modules and then finally pi eval save thread. Uh, sorry, we, yes, we are loading modules. Um, and then pi eval save thread at the end will drop the gil, so if another thread starts up, it, it's okay to acquire it. Another little detail, just because I think it's kind of cute, the standard out and standard error capture that we're doing on the C++ side. Here we've got two C++ functions, log write and log flush. Um, log write takes a string and dumps it to a log file somewhere and log flush actually doesn't do anything because we don't care. But this is just enough methods to create something that looks suspiciously like a Python file object. So then we can replace sys.standardError and sys.standardout with uh, pointers to those uh, pointers to those functions. The pysys set object here uh, lets you replace anything in the sys namespace with something else that you've created. So that's enough to eat standard out and standard error. So that's all easy, right? Um, no, not really. Um, well, it's easy up to that point. Uh, so I mentioned there was a module that implemented a REST API. Uh, that's a web service. And later on, another separate module was added to provide a simple read-only web status dashboard 
for the, the, the cluster. And that's also a web service. And both of these were implemented using Cherry Pi. And I wanted to try the, the new experimental dashboard module, so I loaded this on a test cluster, which was already running the REST API, and then everything fell in a smoking wreck, and that's, this is actually where my um, involvement with this began. Both the REST module and the status dashboard were following this pattern here to use Cherry Pie. Um, I'm pretty sure nobody ever actually imagined using uh, Cherry Pie twice within the same um, process, if you like, trying to run two of them at the same time. This set of statements here are probably run in lockstep by, oh, they're, they're run by two separate threads at approximately the same time. So um, they both listen on a port, they both eat the entire web namespace, they both try to start the Cherry Pie engine, and whichever thread manages to get to cherrypie.engine.start first uh, wins, and whichever one happens to get to cherrypie.engine.start last fails complaining that it can't be called more than once from the same thread which is actually a lie because it is being called from a diff it's not being called from the same thread, but it's being called in the context of the same Python interpreter. Um, so that, that wasn't very good. So I, I brought up this problem on the Ceftavel mailing list and with two suggestions. One was, you know, maybe we can have multiple cherry pies on different ports or, or use virtual hosts, but we've still got to make sure that start only gets called once, so maybe we could have a separate Cherry Pie module that the others use, but then we're introducing module dependencies into our nice little, you know, and it's like, um, so the other, the other option was using Python sub-interpreters, um, which are pretty much isolated from each other, but they run in the, in the same process. And uh, John's response to this was that doing separate sub-interpreters would also be an option that would give us more robustness, generally in the face of Python modules that do global things. And there wasn't any fundamental reason he didn't use it when he was writing this initially. It's just that they were fairly sparsely documented. So I went and read the manual. And the three things that you kind of care about, there's a function you call pi initialize to initialize your interpreter in the first place. Then pi new interpreter will create a new sub-interpreter, which is an almost totally separate environment. It's got its own set of loaded modules, um, its own sys and standard out and standard error and whatnot. That returns a pointer to a thing called a pi thread state. It doesn't create a thread or anything. That's just a the name of a data structure that represents a thread to the Python interpreter. And then there's a third function, which is pi thread state swap, which swaps between whichever active sub-interpreter is, is running. So I said that I thought that I liked that idea and that my best guess was to stick a call to pi new interpreter in the manager uh, module constructor, and given the sparseness of the docs, we should just try it and see what caught fire. And then I read the manual some more and found some slightly conflicting um, documentation in it. Remember the Pi Gil State Ensure and Release APIs? Somewhere in the documentation it says that combining sub-interpreters with the Gil State APIs is delicate because there's a bijection between Python thread states and OS level threads, and that assumption's broken by the presence of sub-interpreters. Uh, I'm not entirely certain I actually knew bijection was a word before reading that, but it means that those APIs assume that uh, exactly one Python thread state is paired with exactly one OS level thread and vice versa. But when we introduce sub-interpreters, we can have many Python thread state objects running from one OS level thread, which so it breaks the model. And later in the documentation, it actually just flat out says um, it's not d delicate at all, it just says it's unsupported. Um, so um, we should probably assume we can't use them. So I needed to do whatever it was that those PyGill state APIs were doing. Uh, so I made a little C++ Gill class, which you instantiate one of these, passing in a pointer to the, the thread state of your sub-interpreter. It calls pyeval restore thread with that thread state pointer, and that acquires the gill and sets the current thread state to what we want, uh, Python thread state to what we want it to be. And when this goes out of scope, it calls pyeval save thread to release the gill. So, um, you, or you really don't want to nest these. You don't want to have one C++ function which creates a gill instance and call another C++ function which creates a gill instance because the second one will deadlock because the first one's already 
um, holding it. But the, this is also true of the Pi Guild State Insure and Release APIs, so it's the same care that you would use either way. So if we combine that with a refactored manager Pi module class where each instance of the class spawns a new interpreter um, and then keeps track of that subinterpreter thread state. Um, our initial setup had to change slightly. We initialize and acquire the gil immediately uh, and then we immediately drop it and save the main Python interpreter's Pi thread state and that then gets passed through to our manager Pi module constructor uh, as does our custom syspath. And this works. Manager Pi modules constructor um, instantiates a gil class uh, at the start. So we've got the gil here. It's safe to go and create a new Python subinterpreter, and that my thread state thing gets saved in this class instance. And then we go and add whatever modules we want and set the system path and everything. And of course, we don't need Pi gil state release at the end because um, well, it wouldn't work anyway. And when that gill instance has gone out of scope, um, the gill's released, so that's all good. And that works fine. If we're creating a new interpreter in the constructor, we should probably destroy it in the destructor, which you would think this would work, pi end interpreter passing in the thread state. Uh, and it does, except in the case where you have loaded a Python module which, in, which itself happens to create some separate OS threads that you've got no idea about. Uh, yes, Python can create threads but all by itself. Um, this happens when you're using Cherry Pi in a module, um, which I didn't know until I went looking for the seg fault. Um, the uh, Cherry Pi runs an extra timeout monitor thread and that spends most of its life sitting in a, in a time.sleep60. Um, um, if the cherry pie and if cherry if you've shut down the cherry pie when that thread eventually finishes that thread actually does terminate but we're ending the interpreter while this thread's still sitting there in this sleep um, and unless you're very very lucky and that sleep finishes at exactly the same time that your destructor is called uh, pi end interpreter will abort because there's still threads lying around and that could of course happen with a poorly written module which made no attempt to actually clean up after itself. So I thought, what about if we maybe terminate the, the subinterpreter? So we can actually detect if there's extra threads created by Python and then not call um, pi end interpreter, uh, which means that we've got a, we, we might have a resource leak of the interpreter or we might not, depending on what's going on. And that thread detection business here, um, I had to figure out by actually reading the source code for pi end interpreter too. Uh, so we didn't do that. Uh, I'm just not terminating the subinterpreters at all, um, which is actually okay in this context because the the um, uh, Ceph manager itself doesn't actually currently let you unload modules at runtime anyway. So everything does get properly cleaned up when the when the whole daemon terminates. So if we did ever want to. We'd, we'd have to come back and do something that actually waited for the threads to terminate if we wanted to clean that up properly. But um, in the context of this daemon, it actually doesn't matter that we're, we're leaking slightly here because everything's about to be killed anyway. So all the pieces are in the right place, I think. And I've got a pull request open for this and then I tested it again and got a seg fault. And that was one of my comments on the pull request. Um, it was seg faulting on shutdown. I'd, I'd put my, my gil class and my refactored manager pi module and the subinterpreter thing is all in one commit. Uh, and John said rightly that it's a tough one to review because the subinterpreter functionality in Python is so weird and suggested splitting the gil class out into a separate commit, which was a really good idea because when I implemented the gil class and just replaced the gil state insure and gil state release with my class without doing any of the subinterpret rubbish, um, I still got the seg fault. Uh, so the lesson here is, and we all know one commit per logical change, and I thought I was making one logical change. I've implemented subinterpreters, but I really should have been making smaller logical changes. It turns out that 
every operating system thread must have at least one Python thread state in existence. When we... I'm not going to explain this part in detail because it's not going to work without drawing pictures and things. The point is that um, the PyGill state ensure functions, when they were called, if there wasn't already a Py thread state present for the current OS level thread, it would create one transparently for you. And so because we're running the serve method from a separate thread, um, we, we've, got a, we've got our Py thread state which is attached to our subinterpreter, but that's on a different that's in a different place. Um, so we actually do need an extra Py thread state which maps to the thread that that serve method was running in. And without doing that, um, it was seg faulting on shutdown because the wrong one of these Py thread state things was active in the context of a different thread. Um, I could explain this better with pictures or possibly interpretive dance, but I've got more to go through. So. Um, this is where things get a little bit ugly. I wanted to try to do the same thing that the Gill State Ensure uh, function was doing, was, was check if there's, if there's already a, a Py thread state thingy or not. Um, and you can do that, and I found out how to do that by reading the source code for Py Gill State Ensure. And this checks the thread ID um, member of the Python thread state and checks if that matches what Python thinks is the current operating system thread. And then if that's the case, it creates a new Py thread state object and switches to it. That works fine, except that the Python C API documentation say that the only public data mem member of, of uh, Py thread state is interp, which is a pointer to the subinterpreter. I'm not allowed to access that thread ID thing from my code. It's meant to be private. Um, so doing this would violate a black box. So bearing in mind that I didn't want to violate a black box and risk having the Python implementation internals change out from under me or, or something, I put the onus back on the caller. There's exactly one place in Surf Manager where we know that we're going to be in a separate OS thread. So I changed the Gil class so it takes a Boolean which says the caller knows that there needs to be a new Py thread state object here, and in that case, when you instan instantiate the gill, it goes and creates one. John has since added a safe thread state class um, which wraps this a little bit and it will assert if you, the author of the code, violate this rule and you're running from a separate, you're calling it from the wrong thread. Having looked at that since, I suspect that we could actually take that safe thread state class, which doesn't violate the Python black box, um, and we could probably use that to, uh, to do this automatically and do away with that, um, uh, uh, that extra Boolean. Um, that would work for us. It wouldn't work if you were doing this on Windows or some other environment that doesn't have POSIX threads, that wouldn't work because the, the, Py threads, the, the safe thread state class that John implemented explicitly does things in terms of P threads. So you'd have to come up with something else if you were doing this on a different platform. Anyway, that's something. Uh, to look at in the future. Some, as I said, some care is required. You actually need to know um, that you really do want a new thread state object, so you actually have to understand this. But um, because I do, and there's only one place that we're using it, it's, it's okay. Uh, and just for the record, the destructor of the Gill class, um, if there was a new thread state created, will then swap back to the previous one and clear and delete the, the, the new one that was created. So now we're all good. My PR for the subinterpreters and the Gill class was actually merged at this point. Awesome. But later somebody discovered that if one of the Python modules that we've loaded that happens to be running Cherry Pie tries to listen on a port that something else is already listening on, the entire Ceph manager process exits. It doesn't just kill that subinterpreter, it kills our entire daemon, everything's dead. Uh, and you get this exciting backtrace in the logs, um, IO error port 7000, not free on wherever. And so I went digging through the cherry pie code to find out what it was doing. <laughs> 
here's where it's raising that I/O error in wait for free port, so it sits spinning for a while, and if it uh, can't bind to something, um, it raises this error. I traced that back through to where that was called from, and got all the way back through to Cherry Pie's bus start, which sets its state to starting and um, tries to start. That self-published start around about there is where that error will be thrown. And it gets caught here. It logs shutting down due to error. And then it calls self.exit. What does self.exit do? If there was an exception thrown while Cherry Pie was trying to start, it goes, oh, I'm just going to kill the whole process, which is not very polite. Uh, but like I said, I don't think anybody's actually ever tried to use Cherry Pie in quite this way before. So. The least worst solution that I came up with for that was to just monkey patch os.exit so it does nothing. <laughs> um, so we did this in the, uh, uh, I've done this in, in individual modules now, although it occurs to me I should probably actually just do that in the base manager module class so that it's, it's monkey patched out for, for, for everybody. Um, so that was fun. So, it took way faster than I imagined I was going to. Um, now we've got sub interpreters are working, um, running in multiple threads. They're loading modules which largely don't stomp on each other. Um, if you go looking through the documentation, you'll discover that it does say that they can still theoretically access each other's file handles if they really wanted to. So, you know, you could, um, you could probably deliberately write something evil that would stomp on other things, but at least um, the sub-interpreter interpreters are enough of an isolated environment that, um, you know, if you're not an insane maniac, you'll basically be fine. Um, or if you, you know, you're not using, uh, Cherry pie. No, cherry pie's great. Um, uh, but yeah, you do still have to take some care when writing these plugin modules because it's still possible for them to, to kill the whole demon if they're misbehaving. If somebody actually does put os.exit in one of their, um, their, their modules. Uh, I should note that the Ceph manager daemon only loads the modules that the administrator has told it to. It doesn't just sit there and go, I'm going to load everything in this directory. Um, so if there ever was a misbehaving Python module, um, w then the administrator could disable it until somebody had a chance to debug it and figure out what the hell was going on. Um, the only things that we enable, the only, there's a couple of modules that we enable by default in, in Ceph as shipped, but they're the ones that have actually been reasonably thoroughly tested and weren't written by insane maniacs, unless you consider people who work on Ceph in general to be insane maniacs, but that's a separate question. Um, so if you're interested in doing something like this in your own C++ application, do do, do a similar thing. Don't just go and load random crap willy-nilly because, um, you know, and let, let, let things be turned off if necessary. Um, there's just one more thing, though. When I was writing the slides for this talk, I actually tried to compile some of the example code. It didn't work. Um, the, there have been a few changes to the Python C API between Python 2 and Python 3, and actually even I discovered the other day between Python 3.4 and 3.5 and 3.6, uh, I might have those numbers wrong, but anyway, there was a couple of functions that changed. Um, so I, I tried to, I compiled this with Python 2, I'm like, cool, I better make sure it works in Python 3, no. Unicode everywhere, so char star becomes wchar underscore t. Um, pi string from string becomes pi unicode from string. Um, and pi init module becomes pi module create, which takes a, another little table that you have to set up. And that just creates the, the module. It doesn't actually load it into the interpreter yet. You call pi import append init tab or one of these other functions in that vein. Those are the things that I've identified that are currently in Ceph Manager that will only build against Python 2. So the first thing that I have to do when I get home after this conference is go and fix that because um, we need a 
Ceph that builds in a pure Python 3 environment for our next OpenSUSE releases and SUSE releases. So, um, but these, these things that have changed uh, between Python 2 and 3 are, uh, do actually seem to be reasonably well documented in the upstream Python docs, so that's cool. Um, if you would like these slides, including fairly copious speaker notes, um, you can get them here. The URL at the bottom, um, Google B, I, that's actually a one, not an L. Um, so that's, that's exciting. <laughs> um, and if you're interested in code that's more than actual just snippets, um, the uh, Ceph project on GitHub, github.com slash Ceph slash Ceph, source slash MGR for manager, source pybind M uh, manager for the Python bits. Um, just um, ignore all the weird Ceph stuff and look for anything that starts with pi underscore, um, and it's not a bad example of how you can do this. So, wait till you get home. yeah. <laughs> um, so with that, I am actually done, um, and I think that means I have time for questions. If anybody's got any. Thank you. Do we have a microphone I can run around with? I or? don't know. Uh, nope, we've got some time for a couple questions, so just um, be sure to repeat them. Mm. Yeah, go for it, Paul. It, I was firstly, first wondering if uh, it was just that all Python modules sort of would be badly behaving and try to randomly create new threads without asking anyone else and things like that. But it sounds like Cherry Pie was particularly egregious here. Is that the case, or is, is just a, it's just an art, the, the thread stuff that you found is an artifact of having to work with Python, Python and its idea of threads? Um, so um, is the thread stuff just something we found from working with Python and its idea of threads, and Cherry Pie seems slightly egregious, and um, are other Python modules like this? I think it's going to depend on the the what you happen to be importing. I mean, if you've, Cherry Pie is something that was written um, uh, intending to be used as uh, a pure Python web server that you would have a Python program that creates an instance of it and then, and then that's it. it I, I don't think anybody ever imagined somebody would want to embed Cherry Pie in something that, that was also doing a bunch of other stuff where, where Cherry Pie itself wasn't really in charge of the whole process. Um, so, uh, uh, do other do other Python modules do similar sorts of things? Uh, it depends on what the assumptions of the authors of the modules were. So, uh, some care required in what you import. Um, There's a follow-on from that. Could you consider a different architecture where you, where you spawn the uh, Python-only process and, and put some sort of communication? Hmm. Um, did we consider spawning separate processes with completely separate Python states and having some sort of communication between them? That's actually something that's come up slightly more recently. The, the, the reason for, for not doing that actually is because if the Python interpreter is embedded inside the C++ application, we've got the most efficient access to all of the data structures that describe the cluster state. And if we were sending that over some other channel, we lose some of that efficiency, um, particularly if we go back to parsing and generating JSON. Um, but that, uh, that question actually came up like two days ago on the upstream Ceftavel mailing list because we're talking about containerizing bits of Ceph and somebody quite rightly, at the moment, the Ceph manager plugins that we've got, there's a REST API, the command line file system status thingy, there's a cluster status dashboard, which is another web server, there's a, uh, an influx DB exporter, there's a, a balancer module that tries to shuffle data around, um, there's a Prometheus, no, uh, Prometheus exporter for getting um, uh, 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 Ceph metrics out of, uh, to send them to Prometheus, and that's another instance of a web server. So we've actually got this, this thing which is, is there's there's like three web servers and a couple of, and none of this is hugely high load, so that's okay. But if you did end up in a situation where, you could conceivably end up in a situation where you really do, particularly if you're containerizing things, um, want to split things off. Um, and 
if we did do that, then that would solve the, the rogue module killing the process thing. So we'll, we'll see. Um, there were two more hands up before I think. Yeah, um, I just was going to ask if multiple modules can be loaded that all try to bind port 7000. You had some code there that stopped it completely trashing the whole process. Yeah. But what would be the desired outcome? Uh, if multiple modules both try to bind to port 7000, what would be the desired outcome? Um, log the error in a log file and um, have the have the, the administrator realised that a service they were expecting to be running wasn't and then go and look in the log file and realise that it was listening on the wrong port and then reconfigure it. The user reconfigures, the user reconfigures it, yeah. So um, if you were writing one of these modules, you would make sure that you exposed the port to listen on as an option, yeah, um, rather than having to have your poor administrator go and find, dig through your Python code and edit it, which would work. You can edit this stuff on a live system if you want to um, play with things and just, you know, Last question, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is more of a than the question, but so I did the same thing in a previous slide for a video game where I embedded Python into the game. And kind of the conclusion after that was that embedding Python is probably not a good idea. And there's some other interpreter which is called for Lua, which is a lot easier to embed and a lot more friendly to the host of Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry? No need to repeat that one. Oh, I'll repeat that one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's it's um, Python embedding Python was the reason for embedding a non C++ language inside a C++ language um, a C++ language the C++ language um, <laughs> is, is still there right we want to be able to make it easy to, to write some modular code that can do things to the cluster without um, uh, without having to worry about all the things you have to worry about when you're writing C++. Um, the reason for choosing Python, uh, even if you know, we have these problems with, with modules potentially stomping each other or taking the process, is because so much of the, other, of the, of the non-daemon parts of Ceph are already written in Python anyway. So it's the, other, it's, it's the other language that's already being used in the project. And if we introduced, what, did you say Lua or something? Or Lua. Yeah, if we introduce that, then it, it's another, um, it's another learning curve or, you know, so, yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, yeah. Everyone